hello. So we are back with our wonderful panelists. That is a nice mix of journalists and educators from the Capital Region. Uh, I figured we'd start with just brief introductions. Uh, Lajas, would you like to start? Hi, everybody. <laughs> I am Lajas. Uh, my scholars refer to me as Mr. Lajas. Um, and I educate. I'm a teacher. I work at Albany Community Charter School, which is now part of the KIPP network. So KIPP ACCS. Um, I teach history there in the middle school, um, eighth grade social studies, seventh grade social studies, and assist with sixth grade. I'm Mercedes Williams, your friendly local neighborhood journalist and weekend anchor uh, at Spectrum News. DJ, administrator at Green Tech, uh, also a social justice instructor as well as varsity basketball coach. I'm Hasara, I'm a reporter at the Times Union and I cover communities of color, refugees, and immigrants. And I'm the Emrakul Bali. I'm a Schenectady native. I currently attend CUNY J School um, in Manhattan, and I specifically work on um, covering news about black women in Schenectady and the rest of 518. Awesome. Well, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, we are here to talk about our program, Student Centered Journalism, which brings a local journalist uh, into a local classroom. Um, but that is a form of engagement journalism. And that is why we have our superstar, Niamh, right here tonight, uh, because she is actually studying a new program at the Craig Newmark Journalism School, like she says, in Manhattan. The program is called Engagement Journalism. So just to get things started, Niamh, can you tell us, what is engagement journalism? Yes, so when it comes to engagement journalism, the, the whole idea, the whole premise is about serving communities and finding new ways to serve them. And particularly, communities are usually left out of the mainstream um, news sphere. So it's like really just focusing on creating um, a pathway for the communities that we cover actually be engaged with our news as well as be engaged in the news making process. So it's really just us as like for me as a journalist, I look at my, my job, my one purpose is to serve the news that people need. So um, in order to do that, I have to engage with the community, have interpersonal relationships with the community in order to create that type of journalism. So yes, that's kind of what engagement journalism is. And Erica, how do you see like this tool being used in the classroom? Yeah, I mean, I, the thing I love about engagement journalism is that it focuses the community around the, the newsroom and brings it into the newsroom and centers their voices instead of what the newsroom thinks should be on air. And I wonder how, if any other educator can speak to this about how do you bring sources into your space based on your students and knowing who they are instead of bringing in what the textbook or state standards might want to see you bring in. So it was a good opportunity to share at Green Tech. We started the uh, social justice course. It was implemented by Dr. Lowe. <laughs> Dr. Lowe, she's our program facilitator. And it was a good course, although virtual. At the beginning of the course, a lot of the students, this course is pointless. We're not gonna be able to change anything. It was during everything that was happening in Albany with the George Floyd, but again, my voice at the end of the year said, here's your chance, opportunity to shed the light on what's going on in your community. Awesome, yeah, and that's so important in the classroom setting, but you know, as a journalist, uh, especially from a TV newsroom, uh, it's really important you know, to kind of switch the way up that we're engaging with communities from a news perspective. Um, Sara, you are a print journalist, so as traditional as it gets in the year of 2021, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how that engagement journalism style that uh, Niamh spoke about may be a little bit different than what you see on a day-to-day -day basis in your newsroom? I think that it just has to be a really concerted effort that comes from reporters. So in general, when you're a new reporter on the job and you get a B, so say your B is environment or education or colony, right? Then your editors are gonna tell you when you start the position, go meet people in the community, uh, you know, ask your colleagues for sources within this topic or within this geographic area, go to town hall, say hi to people, be there, be in their faces, right? Um, that hasn't always traditionally translated to communities of color. And that's where journalists, um, you know, that's a mission of mine. I know Mercedes does that work a lot. There are a lot of other journalists that are breaking through, getting into these traditional institutions and saying, these are communities that have been historically left out. And we don't really have to change anything here, right? We already know these skills. We just have to apply these skills to a different community and a different population and it's not as hard as you guys might think it is mm -hmm. and that's everything that I do is making sure that I connect with those communities and that I have them tell me what do you want to see in the news what do you what do you want me to write about what are the stories that you think are being left out 
Absolutely. And I think like those interpersonal skills that are needed to engage with historically excluded communities exist, should exist definitely in the news, but also in the education system. One of the things that attracted me so much to you, Lajas, uh, is the way that you're able to connect with your students uh, and your community. You know, you have live Facebook lessons, you're always posting your curriculum so the parents and other community members can be involved. Uh, would you be able to speak just briefly about how you're able to develop those interpersonal relationships with your community? Um, yeah, I think that the biggest thing is just as an educator and you know, DJ does this great, um, is we just build relationships with our students and we sustain and then make sure that we continue to build on those relationships. So when our students leave us, we, the relationship doesn't end. And so we're connected to the students, to their siblings, to their parents and their relatives who are also connected to other children and other cousins, right, that go to different schools and other, you know, aunties and uncles or just community members, right? So it's all about building relationships. And the more relationships that you build and continue to uh, mentor and continue to foster, uh, the stronger those relationships get in the community. So you can walk around the community and be like, hey, you know DJ? Oh, yeah, from the tech? Yeah. Or you know Lajas? Oh, the teacher from the school? Yeah, yeah, I know him. And even if they don't know us personally, they've heard us, right? So it's just a matter of building those relationships, right? And the same thing will go for the, uh, you know, for, for Sarah and Mercedes and, you know, for anybody in, in, in journalism is once you build a relationship and you can get the community or members in the community to vouch for you, it's just word of mouth at that point. And it's just like, oh, no, that's good people. You know what I mean? That Yeah, that's who that is and then it kind of disarms everybody so you know we continue to build these relationships and you know in terms of just for the scholars like that's how you connect to the community you start there with the youth because they got a whole village behind them you know and, and one thing I love about engagement journalism and how it connects to education is like teachers have the benefit of having that classroom every single day where the community is coming in and you get to build those relationships but journalists don't have that every single day but engagement journalism promotes that sort of idea and ideal where it's basically like a classroom existing constantly, that, that vibe of community, which teachers do so well of building that community culture. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think, you know, like we're kind of taking it for granted where we're like, well, it's just relationship building. It's so simple. It's so easy. Uh, but I think there's a lot of people in our industry that are not doing that work. Uh, and that alone is why we're having this conversation with you all tonight. Uh, and we're bringing these you know, special people together uh, to highlight and demonstrate what this engagement looks like uh, in both media and education. Sorry, I wanted to add to that though. Yes. So like some, what, what Sarah was referring to, a lot of people misinterpret that as networking, right? right. right. So they say like networking, right? We're, we're not doing this networking. We are building relationships. That's, yeah. that's a whole different thing. I can network, like we can sit on this panel and I can get you all your business cards mm -hmm. and I may or may not connect with you later. Right. But if we're going to build relationships that allow us to uh, be familiar and comfortable faces and voices in our community, then we have to do the follow up and we have to stay engaged. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah, it's a little bit easier for DJ and I because we're in a classroom. So we're with our children all the time and we connect and we have conversations with them and they bring the stories and the sources to us. We really don't got to do all that work. We just got to facilitate. Right. right, right. <laughs> you know, but when we say we about to bring y'all into the classroom, we have to vouch for y'all mm -hmm. in order for our students to be like, all right, yeah, I can open up to them because yeah. DJ said they was cool or Laha said they were cool. <laughs> but we've done the groundwork in building the relationship, right? So if the journalists now start doing that groundwork as well, then you know, you, you, you'll, you'll be able to build more community that way. Absolutely, and I can't sit here without asking Mercedes Williams to tell us to lay the blueprint down for journalists in small cities across the country, uh, you were able to build an incredible relationship with the community here in Albany. Uh, you're one of the few black women that the community gets to see on television. It means a lot for the viewers. It means a lot for journalists like ourselves sitting here. Uh, what can you tell other journalists in the area um, to help get them motivated to start doing the work that you've been doing in the community for years? I think for me, why I love engagement journalism so much is because I'm always increasing my circle of, of contact and spheres. I think like as a journalist, a reporter, you can kind of fall into that danger zone of always relying on that, that one person, that one community voice that you, um, you always speak to you know, in a pinch and things like that. And then next thing you know, you're always talking to that person or it's like, oh, we just talked to that person last week. So 
for me, I like to go out into the community actively looking for stories, actively talking to people. I know sometimes when I come up to people, they're like, who are you? <laughs> but I think it's really important when you really say you want to engage in your community, that doesn't always mean going to every single fundraiser um, that has been put out by this one person, but that also means going into the neighborhood and just sitting down and talking to someone, and you never know what um, can come from that. So it, it's really important as a journalist to always be thinking about expanding your sphere of contact. Can I add to that really quick? I, I love what you just said about it's not just about going to one person's fundraisers, but finding basically your random people on the streets because I think an issue with journalism for so long has been that power structure of we're only gonna go to the people at the top. And that's why we keep going to the same people. We're all only gonna go to, we love Alice Green, but we're only gonna go to the Alice Greens. We're only gonna go to the Harris Overlanders. We're only gonna go to the people at the top because those are the ones who we see to be more credible. Mm -hmm. But what makes them more credible than anyone that you run into on the street? What makes their perspective, their voice, their story, their experience matter more than the people that you run into on the streets? And that's what's really important too, is dismantling that power structure that has existed in sourcing for journalism for so long, because then you can get to the most authentic representative storytelling. Yeah, absolutely, and I think you know that's something that, as a journalist, it's something I had to learn for myself when I first stepped into my job. I was like, I'm gonna be a journalist, just like everyone else, and I'm like, wait a minute, I can't do that. I have to do it in a different way. Uh, and that's what I think is so interesting about your program. So maybe, Niamh, you can explain a little bit about how your university is preparing you to be able to like dis deconstruct power systems? I mean, the one thing that I really enjoyed about the first semester in my program was like, it was really a lot of conversations about how would we, like how would we execute mm -hmm. engagement journalism? And the one thing that I always took away from those conversations was that you really just need to, like what Mercedes was saying, need to like really build those conversations, talk to people, um, like and regular degular people, mm -hmm. like people who are just always in the community, like that one icy lady, I don't know if you guys don't remember what reference is, like someone that's, in, that's just here that's, watching everything that you can go to mm -hmm. and like really building that relationship. I mean, I, I always like like the idea of building really big connections with people and like engagement in journalism allows me to build real connections with people, lifelong connections with people in the sense that like they trust me, right? Mm -hmm. Like if they have a news story or if there's something going on in the community, I want to build that relationship to them. So like they're like, they call me up and they're like, hey, this is something really important. I think this should be in the news. So I guess like the one thing that I really enjoy about my program is that they really emphasize that emphasize like even off the job like it's getting to the point where like I remember one conversation we had it's like you might need to actually be doing it off hours in the sense that like hey I might just take a coffee with this woman who I met when I was you know doing on the field and I'm taking coffee with her and she talks to me I talk to her mm -hmm. that's that's where that work really lies and that's where it's really strong mm -hmm. I mean again it seems really easy and it seems really simple because it is but at the same time what Lois was saying earlier is just like you can't just kind of go up to anybody like you have to have like people being able to vouch for you people really feeling comfortable with you especially when you said um the historically like ways that we like the journalism industry has like impacted certain people or neglected certain communities yeah. um it's really really important for us to go out of our own comfort zone and build those relationships it's really like community organizing but we're doing it from a news perspective and i think that's why i really enjoy the program and they really push that on us yeah yeah and one thing that i'm just really hearing about this is there's so many different things that people can do and things that work when it comes to engage different communities that are excluded and also just shifting that power which is so important when it comes to addressing the current systems and wanting to shift them into something else that's more equitable and that's what something that student-centered journalism does to help transition us a little bit there where student-centered journalism isn't the answer, it's one strategy that we want to kind of promote and also encourage other people to create their own solutions just like we did uh, and we just want to use it as an example really. Yeah, so coming up uh, we're going to hear from our pairs of journalists and educators uh, to get a little behind the scenes of what their experience was with the programs, what stories the journalists told uh, and what perspectives the students really wanted to elevate. Um, so stay tuned for that. Welcome back. Uh, really excited to be having a larger conversation because as we said before, student-centered journalism is one example of engagement journalism. It's one example of getting the community involved in education and journalism. 
So we want to have a larger theoretical discussion around the work that we're putting into this so it can inspire other people to take this torch. So the first question I want to ask everybody is, what can middle school and high school students contribute to their local news? Students can be the voice of their community through their lens to uh, share their thoughts on what should be shared, whether it be positive instead of negative, because a lot of the time like, it's shed on the negative stories opposed to the uh, positive things that happen in the community. Yeah, and that was actually one of my favorite parts about working with your class with student-centered journalism was how much they focused on joy, and they really held on to that, and just even knowing that they can have that power to hold on to that and influence that in a, in, in a different way is really incredible. Yeah, I would, I would just add that um, they're gonna bring their voice, right? Or, or a voice that represents their age, right? So even if it's not somebody from a school that I attend who was speaking, that's a middle school student, so they spoke like that's me, you know? So uh, high school students, like that's us, right? And so they feel like, you know, their voices are being validated, right? Uh, they can bring a fresh perspective, they can bring a raw perspective, you know? And so they're also gonna say some things that we may or may not be ready to hear, right? Um, so, you know, cause I, I think, you know, DJ got the high school students. They might be a little bit more mellow by the time they're, you know, middle school, that's a wild area, you know what I mean? Yeah, and they really don't have a, a filter, you know, which is a good thing, you know, and we work on, you know, uh, um, coaching them through how to, you know, uh, express themselves, but not too much because we want to know what you want to say. And we want to know how you feel and we want to be able to, you know, put that into the writing. So I think that, you know, middle school and high school students to just bring a fresh perspective. Like DJ said, and they'll let you know if they feel like you shedding too much light on the negative, we'll focus on the positive. Right. And they'll take it as an opportunity to be honest. <laughs> they, they won't sugarcoat it. Right, right, right. Yeah, we definitely felt that. And Mercedes, you actually got to go in, even though it was a pandemic, we somehow made it happen right before graduation. You got to go into La Haas's classroom and actually work directly with the middle school students. Uh, so that idea of kind of listening to students' perspectives and elevating their perspectives in order to, you know, generate a story topic, uh, that is something that's a little bit different than what we're used to in the news, so to say. It's, you know, we don't hear much from the youth. We don't hear enough from the youth. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about how that might have impacted the way you told your story? Uh, actually getting that from the students and having to think about them as throughout the whole, you know, journalistic process. Well, like there's this saying where it's like from the mouth of babes, right? Like the youth, it, like you said, it's like it's so unfiltered that when you see when you when they have some of these crit critiques or praises, mm -hmm. you're like, I would have never, I would have never thought of that. There were so many moments in your class where the students, first of all, I was so surprised, like they sat there and they watched my like <laughs> two minute long piece, and they were like, Wow, you know, I didn't know that this was a, particularly mm -hmm. the Ar Albany farmers. I didn't know that that's how it worked. I didn't know how that, and I mean, like, I was emotionally moved because. I'm like, they really absorbed it, took it in. And then there was a point when, with that same story, they said, oh, but the title though, I don't like the way the title saying the Albany Farmers is a new thing. We've been here, we've been out here, you know? And I was like, and so when it moves from television to web, that's that one thing where you just have to say, okay, I have to be present throughout the entirety because when you hand it off to the web department, it goes through different hands um, in case you guys didn't know. Uh, so it's just like, I have to be more present and it just, it just brought out all of these, all the good and like, you know, the things that I need to work on and it was just amazing. Yeah, awesome. And Niamh, maybe you can speak a little bit about kind of like that editing process and like, you know, including the community in that process and how difficult it can be when you hear someone like Mercedes say that there's other people that are touching this story. There's people that are changing these headlines. It is, journalism is a collaborative process. Right, exactly. So from an engagement journalism perspective, how do you guys view that collaborative process? So I think that's another thing that's really always talked about in my classes, um, especially just understanding that for us as engagement journalists, we have, well, our goal is to serve the communities and our goal is to make sure that they're at every point throughout the news making process. And I think, especially as a person who is, who's trying to build their own journalism career, I've just, I already can sense that there is going to be that sense of difficulty mm -hmm. on, um, on letting like newsrooms and, you know, editors understand that like, 
we actually really need to allow them to be a part of the news making process from the beginning all the way to the editing all to the end and even when I say the end I mean after it's published and cleared out we need to go back to them and ask them hey what did you like what didn't you like what could be done better how how was this story impacted you how did this like change certain things or certain perspectives with you as well as the rest of the community members like it's so important and I think that's the engagement part of all of it is allowing the community that we're writing about or that we're um, covering news for to be a part of every step of the news making process so like one thing that we talked a lot about um, in classes mm -hmm. is you know if we if COVID wasn't necessarily a thing um, what we would do is have probably what once or twice a week have community members come into the um, meetings, like whether it be um, for storytelling or whatever, we'll have literally community members in the newsroom saying, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Like those types of steps. And again, it really does push the community to feel connected to the work, mm -hmm. right? Like I'm pretty sure you guys all, like I, I know that you guys didn't, wasn't able to um, do the last part, which is going back to them and asking their reactions. But I'm telling you, I'm pretty sure the kids were probably super excited to be like, hey, I was a part of that. Like the journalist was in my, um, classroom and I definitely like talked about this story like or going back home like hey mom like there's this story coming out and we were all a part of that like mm -hmm. that's that's the one part that I really enjoy is having the community feel like they're connected yeah. to the news pieces because that's how you build trust like especially in the news world we're always talking about building trust with our audiences that's how you build trust bring them in bring them into this news making process make it um make it so they also feel like this is their baby too and they want to be connected because that's when you start seeing people sharing more people mm -hmm. wanting to like tap into that either news organization or journalist that's doing that work because they feel connected to it they feel heard and listened to so that's something that's really been stressed throughout our program mm -hmm. is finding new ways to bring them into the news making process because that's really what's necessary and that's what's going to push us forward and like transform the journalism industry in general is allowing the community to be really a part of every step Absolutely. And Eric, is it okay if I ask you a question? Absolutely. I'm curious if you can maybe like articulate for us how that can translate into the classroom. Because the idea mm -hmm. of like, okay, for journalism, there's this entire process where, you know, maybe the community should be involved in, you know, from the beginning to the end, like Naomi was saying, in like school and classrooms and like the pedagogy and curriculum, what are ways that we can make sure that the students are actually involved in the process of their learning? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is for teachers to stray away from teaching to the test, from teaching to the textbook, from really assuming, you know, the things that we have to learn and trying to more so shift to the things that the students want to learn and how they want to learn them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, does any other teacher want to respond to this? This is kind of a tough one. I think that when, when the scholars saw their, you know, guiding question worksheet, right? And mind you, this, this experience for them was at the end of the school year. Okay, so um, even though they're, mine are only eighth graders, they're experiencing that first level of senioritis. Like, I'm about to graduate from this middle school. You trying to get me to do journalism, right? <laughs> um, and so for the scholars who were involved, though, they got to see how the process looked from the other side. So they thought to themselves, like, oh, okay, so this is how they, this is how they do their stories. Like, they, they observe, they think about what's missing, whose voices are being you know amplified whose voices are not like is this what they kind of asked themselves i was like well yeah did you ask them that though like you know um so the you know being able to see those um those guiding questions right and kind of giving them that little bit of pre-work to do gave them insight into what the journalists would do right um how you would think or act on this and yeah to your point they felt like you know they were engaged, they were learning, they were talking, um, but it wasn't their social studies curriculum. It wasn't their ELA work. This was something, you know, new and fresh, right? Um, that kind of really was, you know, really driven by them. So they, they took a lot more ownership in it, right? So they, you know, what is the story that you guys want to put out? So they really thinking about it. You know, at first they were, they were quiet, right? So they're like, we don't know. We could just pick one of those stories and, you know, just kind of work from there. And eventually they kind of, you know, started to get more comfortable with the process and, uh, you know, really brought it to fruition. So, yeah. And it was good just being a part of the social justice course. Because like I, as I said, at the beginning of the year, they were all like, we don't have a voice. This, this course doesn't matter, especially uh, focusing on the stories during the rioting. You will only see stories about 
the looters and the rioters, let's put a view on the people who are actually protesting for the right reasons. Let's put that out there in the front. And I just think if this was available <laughs> during the beginning, we could have added it and put it right there together and it been good for both ends. Yeah, and just having teachers like Lajas and DJ in the classroom that really elevate the students' critical thinking and putting that at the front of the classroom instead of the actual curriculum itself and letting that guide the process, I think, can be a, a really key part of that. Yeah, a way to kind of bring that engagement journalism theory into the education system. Mm -hmm. Um, Masara, I'm very interested to hear from you. Uh, I know you worked closely uh, with DJ and the Green Tech students to bring a level of joy uh, that we kind of talked about that in the student-centered journalism section, uh, that the students in the class really said, you know, there's a lot of negative coverage. We wanted to see something that was joy. Uh, but then you also had some students that said, well, hey, a minute, wait a minute, we want to make sure we use this opportunity to talk about what's really going on. Uh, so if you can kind of talk a little bit about how you were able to make both of those things come true, because it's kind of like two opposite ends that they were asking for. Yeah, they were really, they really liked the Times Union story that was published about um, Albany High School's first black valedictorian. They said, this is awesome, and highlighting black success and black joy. Um, but then the students were also really concerned about the gun violence that was happening in the community. And I, for one, was, I didn't want to really broach that topic because so much of the time communities of color get covered in that context and within that topic. So I wasn't going to put that on the students. But they brought it up and it was something they were really concerned about and curious about. And so there was this kind of debate among the students like, oh, we really like these joyful stories. And I think it was probably half half, like yeah. half of the students wanted joyful stories and half of the students wanted a story focused on gun violence and someone broke the tie. <laughs> <laughs> and someone was a tiebreaker. Um, and so, so then I kind of talked to them about, okay, is there a way that we can meld the two together in, in some way? And that's where we came to the idea of what if we write about what happens after gun violence? Mm -hmm. So what if we write about how the community comes together and grieves and heals in the aftermath of gun violence? And I just thought, like, for me as a, as a reporter, I was so grateful to be in that space because I cover gun violence a lot. Mm -hmm. And I'm always looking for new angles and perspectives and context to put the gun violence in. Um, and I was running dry on story ideas and talking to them it just kind of sparked this idea where yeah you know what all the time news coverage covers up until the bullets are shot and then maybe there's an obituary about the person who tragically lost their life after the fact and then that's it and mm -hmm. there's never any follow through there's never any follow up and so this could be a great opportunity to look at a family or an individual who lost a loved one to gun violence and just seeing what does that look like for them years after the fact, you know? And um, unfortunately, the story wasn't necessarily as happy as I would have liked it to be. I mean, of course it's not. They lost someone that they loved to gun violence. It's so tragic and so sudden. Um, so I don't know how the students felt about the story in the end because it was more about coping and trying to figure out how to heal than actually healing and, and, and moving on, you know? Mm -hmm. But that's the other thing about journalism is you go into a story and you think that you know what the story is gonna be and you have this idea, but sometimes you have to let the story direct you and carry you into what the story is meant to be and turn into. Um, but that was definitely, like, it was a very rewarding experience. Yeah, I think, like, kind of that, the fact of, like, this is journalism, sometimes the story changes. Uh, is something that we're gonna have to like tackle head on with engagement journalism. So I'm going back to Niamra for this one. What would you say to that? Like, how do you communicate that change? How do you communicate like that journalistic process to a community member who's sitting and waiting for a joyful story to be published? Uh, how do you prioritize that trust in, in that, those scenarios? So like for me, it's, again, going back to like what I've been learning, it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of like understanding, like what she's saying, understanding where, two sides are coming from, but then also, again, being very trans transparent to the community mm -hmm. to, and understanding that, like, you know, this is a story that we might want, that we want, might want to tell, but, like, this is where it's leading. And, mm -hmm. like, again, bringing them in and being like, this is where it's leading, being as transparent as possible. Like, do you understand why it might need to go this way? Mm -hmm. Or, like, even breaking it down, like, really having these conversations are really hard but it's like again i think it's really important for us to continue to have that dialogue throughout the entire process mm -hmm. so what i would probably be doing is just like hey we thought this story's gonna go one way this is where it's going mm -hmm. you know um 
does it speak to what people are actually going through? Because even with that example, like, of course, people want to heal and stuff, but a lot of it is just coping. A lot of it is just trying to figure it out each day. And sometimes maybe we need to write that story that like it's a daily coping situation Mm -hmm. and we don't necessarily have the answers but at least other people in the community are seeing that transparency and seeing like that's some real stuff like Mm -hmm. that's real like taking it day by day um coping all that's real and they'll feel more connected to that because it's more honest to what is actually happening compared to even like creating a story and yes we want it to be joyful but we also want it to be very true to the core so i think just walking them through that process, being as transparent as possible with the community members, and just, again, allowing them that space to be a part of the newsmaking process really kind of hones in all of that together. Yeah, and I think one thing that definitely stands out to me is, like, the time and emotional labor it takes to do the work. Like, it is not easy. Like, we have to put in extra work to build those relationships, especially with people that we've neglected, you know, year after year after year after year. Uh, So one thing I love about Green Tech uh, is that they actually gave you a chance to be able to create a class during the pandemic where most schools were like, hands on their heads, we can't get anything done. You had an ad, the Green Tech had an admin step in and actually create a course for the first time. So maybe DJ, you could speak a little bit about like the school culture that allowed that decision to come to fruition. Um, because I think that a lot of the times people take for granted uh, when we see great things and there's a lot of work that goes into that. So maybe if you could speak to how your school allows you know, you to step up to the plate the way they do or what they do to support you and your mission specific to social justice. So it's good that we have the autonomy to create a curriculum that's centered around what the students' interests are. And to have have that course implemented this year, being virtual was good. A lot of the students learned, I learned a lot from it, studying just creating the uh, lesson plans. Like I, I taught myself a, a yeah. lot of things while learning for it. And then in addition to it, moving next year, we're gonna keep, keep it as a course, but we might also try to implement it as an after school activity or something like that. Awesome, and Mercedes, do you, you know, you seem to be covering all the stories that you could ever mm-hmm. desire, everything that happens, you get all the right people on television. Uh, what are they doing over at Spectrum that's allowing you to kind of like, you know, touch and do the work that you really want to do? I feel like their openness to listen to us as journalists really has um, given me like that freedom to be like, because I mean, I feel they're the, a, a catalyst, but let's not, let's be honest. The catalyst to a lot of these newsrooms saying, okay, hey, we got to re-look at how we're diversifying our stories and people who are reporting them um, happened after 2020, happened after the George Floyds and things like that. So, but I feel like um, their commitment to doing that, um, I've noticed, like I'll turn on the television and it may not be a reporter of color who's reporting the story, but it's a story of color, an issue of color. And I've been kind of proud to see that. Um, Another thing I noticed um, when George, the anniversary of George Floyd's death came along, and I knew that that was going to be an important topic to um, people, and so I said, hey, you know, we should do something, and they went a step further. They're like, okay, we're going to give you a one-hour special, and we're going to include, like, all of upstate, and I was like, okay. (laughs) So it just feels like um, they have really been showing that effort to be committed to diversity within the newsroom on screen and um, the stories that they're telling. And I feel like that makes a big difference on the people who are viewing it because I, I mean, I hear from people every day, you know, it's so nice to see um, someone like you on TV because I, you know, I think that I can do that one day. I, can, I mean, that always gets me, even though I hear it a lot, it's still like when it comes from somebody, I'm just like, it shakes me out of what I'm doing. And I'm like, okay, this is why engaging students and people in the community really matters because it's a trajectory of you know, livelihoods. Can I just say something to that? Um, Especially me um, growing up and being from Schenectady, um, I knew I wanted to be a journalist since I was like 16 years old. And one of the reasons why I actually left um, my hometown was because I didn't think I could do it here. And one of the things that are now encouraging me to do it here and to invest here is seeing you on television. So I need you to know that like it really does impact people. It really does like it really touches my heart. Like when we were together earlier today and I saw you up there, I'm like, I'm happy. Like that makes me feel good because 16 year old me didn't have that. And I'm just really happy that maybe another little black girl in high school who wants to be a journalist sees you, it's gonna really encourage them to be like, hey, I can do it in my own hometown. I don't necessarily need to like leave and do all these other things. So yeah, like it really, it's a lot. Yeah, it's good. 
Beautiful. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to say that. I just had to say that. <laughs> and I do want to say that while it definitely is on the individual, like we have amazing journalists and educators here, and you guys have all gone above and beyond, especially when your communities needed you most within this past year with the pandemic and, you know, the killing of George Floyd. Um, but what I'm interested to hear is you know, what is your school doing um, to support you? You know, we're all very busy people. Lahas, you're moving today. <laughs> you know, like, it's really important to me that the schools and the newsrooms are doing all that they can to make sure that every one of you stays in your position and every one of the students, everyone in the community gets to absorb the benefit of having you all in these positions of power. Uh, so Lahas, what do you think your school is doing to make it so you can thrive in your school environment? Well, my school is the best. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to make eye contact with DJ right now. <laughs> we all in this together. It's though. the best middle school. Yeah, all right. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt, no doubt, no doubt. No doubt, no doubt. Um, but yeah, like, you know, what? something that DJ had just uh, said, you know, like our leadership ha is giving us leadership, autonomy, right? They are saying you're directly with the students. What should the students be working on or what do the students want to be working on and sure we still have to do our ela and our math and our science and our social studies but within that how can we make sure that they're at the center of it or they're they're leading it right um and so like you know um when I say we're all in this together, I mean that. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, everybody, you know, we all talk about our teams and our school and our, our grade level or whatever. You know what I'm saying? But when we talk about building community, like, I'm Mr. Lajas to more than just the students at ACCS. Because when they leave here, they're with DJ, right? Some of them are with DJ. Some of them are at the high. Some of them are at different high schools, connected, Detroit, wherever. So I'm also connecting to other educators, right? And to educators that I've had in the past. Um, and my school leadership allows me to make that connection and then to bring that there, right? So as long as we're having conversations with each other, they know like, look, as long as it's about the children, then it is what it is, you know, and it's good, right? And it's, it, it's uh, furthering, furthering their learning experiences. Um, and I would like to argue that school leaders love to be at the forefront of new and exciting adventures like this, <laughs> right? That are also going to benefit the students, right? So like, but uh, um, you know, like my principal doesn't ask for any praise or any credit. You guys got to meet her like once mm -hmm. or twice. Like she came up to check in, but like it's about the students. So like, I trust you, DJ. I trust you, Lajas. Let's make this happen. And let's, and, and it's happening. So yeah, like, did it work out? Great, cool. They coming back? <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, let's do it again. Mercedes, um, you coming back? <laughs> I'm definitely coming back. Right? You know? Um, so let's do it again. And, 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 you know, there were seventh graders across the hall that are now about to be in my eighth grade class. And they were kind of like, what's going on over there? And how come we don't get to do that yet? And I'm like, patience, young grasshoppers. Your time will be yours next year. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But... Um, so again, like our school leadership is, is, is empowering us um, because as long as it's empowering the students, we all win. We all win. Yeah, and I really feel like education is always at the forefront of these types of changes. And as Mercedes said, there's more of a larger shift after the murder of George Floyd and newsrooms are kind of catching up a little bit. And I want to shout out the Times Union as well for working with us as a print publication and kind of bringing us into their space to be able to do this program because newsrooms are, you know, some of them might be a little bit more asleep than others, but they're waking up to how key they are for democratic change, just as it is for education as well. Yeah, I actually want to give an extra shout out too, because um, the Times Union actually got involved in a program called Table Stakes, which is uh, created by the American Press Institute. It's a press institute, it's a nonprofit media organization. And we started that program in April 2020. And one of our goals in that program was to better engage um, black readers and to better engage communities of color in general, but specifically black communities. And so, you know, I just like to say, like, we were ahead of the curve. Like, we weren't waiting for Floyd to take those steps. And it was really, it felt really good to already be in that position of having started the really nitty gritty in the mud work um, 
so we were prepared when really a, a catastrophe happened. Right. Um, still had to have a lot of big conversations in the newsroom. Still, you know, always am gonna, are going to need that training that you guys provided and more training to address the whiteness that does exist in the newsroom. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was just really cool to see the newsroom leadership really take those steps to go outside of their comfort zone and go outside of what's traditionally been done. Okay, well, I think that that wraps up our discussion this evening. I just want to give a big thank you to the Center for Law and Justice for making this conversation, making these projects in both schools and both newsrooms possible. Uh, and thank you to the amazing journalists and educators and our engagement journalism expert uh, for taking the time to share their wisdom and experience with us. Uh, our hope for this is that other schools and newsrooms throughout the Capital Region will say, we want to do this work too. Uh, and you'll have this video to kind of lay the blueprint down for how you guys can get started doing engagement journalism as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.